and uh, we'll get started probably in about two minutes. Harold, did that show that it's recording for you? Let's see here. Yes, it does. Thank you, Mary. So we are recording this. So that everybody knows. Give it another minute and then um, I'll get us going. And once I do that, Mary, if you could watch for late arrivals, that would be great. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're going to get going. We have a presentation for you today that will take about an hour. And before we get started, I want to say we're so glad you're joining us. It's a busy week. And um, I'm here with Mary Mattingly. We are the co-directors of the Confluence MFA. And uh, it's always a treat for us to share what we've been up to in the last year and also give uh, prospective students an overview of the program. So thanks for being with us here today. And again, we will be recording. We will be presenting in four sections. We can go on to the next slide. And we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions after each section. Um, by the end of the talk, you will have heard about the residents we had, residencies we had in 2023, and you'll have a better understanding of how this low res curriculum works, as well as knowing more about our educational philosophy. Along the way, you'll get to know more about our community, including students, faculty, and alumni. And you'll also get the lowdown on how to apply. But before we get into um, the details, we want to give you seven attributes of our program so that for those of you who are just getting to know it, you have sort of the, the thumbnail of what we are and how we work. There are two residencies a year. Students and faculty meet in person at those times. Students are part of a cohort in which they all start and graduate at the same time. The curriculum's built for working adults who have a connection to where they live, and that connection really enriches our community. Our curriculum is built differently. It's based on systems thinking, it's integrative, and it brings together art life and adaptability with the world at large. So we're very holistic and innovative. We are also proud to be an experimental and interdisciplinary program. We use a field-based curriculum. You'll see how this unique field-based pedagogy brings out the learning in settings different than the white cube of the university. And finally, our dedication to regenerative culture makes us visionary and also practical. So let's dive into the residencies from this year. We've got um, a mini tour of uh, the winter residency last year in Oaxaca, as well as the summer residency in New Mexico, as well as some thoughts about what's coming around the corner in our winter residency in Mexico City that we're preparing for now. One year ago, we were preparing for our January Oaxaca residency. This two-week residency had the fieldwork components of three classes. One was Art and Place Reconsidered, which addressed the economics of ethnobotany. Another was Technolab, Distinguished Practitioner, which was an investigation of weaving and natural dyeing with the artist collective Women Who Weave in Teotitlan del Valle. Students also had critiques and a public exhibition. 
The Oaxaca residency provided our students with on the ground learning that brought readings that they had completed before the residency into focus. The course Art in Place Reconsidered addressed ways that artisans and artists have been working with ethnobotanical processes and how they share the results of their craft with their publics through solidarity economies as well as market economies. From the complexities of maize, and here you see on the left the group Zub Maize with their ancestral corn tortilla production in their learning hub in Oaxaca City, to on the right, where students were visiting a small family farm and the farmer was teaching the students to make tamales on her, her um, outdoor kitchen, in her outdoor kitchen. So we went to many locations. Next slide. As you know, Oaxaca is a place where indigenous culture is vibrant and the struggle to maintain autonomy in the face of corporatization, US trade policies and Mexican governmental restrictions is fierce. A full set of readings, videos and artist profiles were assigned a month ahead of the residency to give students a working knowledge of these realities. Being able to explore the graphic art traditions in Oaxaca City with artist guides was part of the understanding of the tensions of the rapid gentrification in Oaxaca City, and also to see how artists are addressing political issues through their work directly on the city walls. Students visited printmaking collectives and met with the muralist Buhler. His murals are on the left here. To get a sense of the multiplicity of art worlds in Oaxaca and to integrate this into their mapping of Oaxaca's economics of ethnobotany. This was a very sensory res residency from processing clay with their feet to dyeing wool over steaming vats and weaving on large floor looms. The students were really centered sensorially in the curriculum. So here we're at the studio of Doña Sandra in San Bartolo on the left and the Women Weaving Collective in Teotitlan on the right. Following the critiques, the residency culminated with a group exhibition at La Calera, a vast former lime processing plant turned into an exhibition space in Oaxaca City. We also wanted to share how the students in Distinguished Practitioner, the course, distinguished practitioner created a book for the Women's Weaving Collective. Um, each time we start that class, we ask what the distinguished practitioner would like in exchange for welcoming students into their practice. This timeline shows that um, the history of the collective, we can advance. Actually, let's stay right here. So um, that's good. Timeline is great. The, the history of the collective is really fascinating because it includes the women overcoming the exclusion of women weavers at the time. This was back in the um, 80s and 90s when they uh, were working very hard to even be recognized by, by their village. And now, as you can see here, they've worked with Levi Strauss, they've really expanded. And so it's a very inspiring history. Producing projects like that book that have a life in the world is a big part of this MFA program. Here you can see some of the assignments our students completed over the eight year history of this curriculum. From a cob oven at a community garden to projects with museums, we often stack functions to use a permaculture term so that students work so that the student work serves these different modalities and um, helps them learn, but also contributes to the world. Now we're going to go on to the summer residency. The summer residency is three weeks long, and it's always held in New Mexico. You can see at the top of the text here that each cohort has specific coursework. And for the graduating students, a big part of their time in the residency is their group exhibition and their final exam. We had several public events, including public talks and visiting critics who reviewed student work. One of the highlights of the residency was working with Roxanne Swenzel as we camped above Abiquiu Lake. 
learning how to make with work with clay from a Puebloan perspective. And we were all also eating the traditional Puebloan diet. This was followed by working with the clay at flowering tree permaculture as students prepared for a feast called the Last Supper on the final day of the residency. At this feast, each student presented a dish that their ancestors ate before the colonial era. And they ate from a place setting that they made during the class. And here on the right, you can see one of the students' forks. Another highlight of the residency was River Lab Art and Ecology, in which students worked with Mary Mattingly and visiting Fulbright artist Marta de Menendez. And in this course, students used hydrophones, CRISPR technology, and other strategies to consider how artists can create tools to interact with the Rio Grande and her surrounding bosques. In the month following the field work with the river, each student presented their own tool back to the class that they had created. One of the most important parts of the summer programming is the thesis exhibition for the graduating cohort. So last year's show was called Care and Curiosity, and it featured the work of our seven graduating members of the cohort, cohort number six. We hold an unofficial graduation celebration during the residency, and here are the graduates after that graduation brunch. Um, to wrap up this section on residencies, uh, we want you to know that we're now preparing for our January 2024 residency in Mexico City. And we're super excited that our students will be working with Pedro Reyes to develop an app for his library project called Tlaquilo. And we will also be doing a social practice project through the lens of polycultures with artist Johanna Roa. Um, as well as the usual critique class and exhibition at the Lagos residency site. So at this point, we're going to pause for just a minute and see if anybody has any questions about what they've just seen. Again, we will go through the structure of the program in the next section that Mary will present. If you have questions, just jump right in. It's we also fine everybody, to wait so, yeah. until... Yeah, feel free yeah. to just unmute. Yeah, so you need to... Yeah. So Mary, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Sounds good. Um, so I'm going to go through a general overview of how the curriculum rolls out. Um, this is looking at the summer and winter intensives. So like Carol mentioned, um, well, there are three summer sessions and then two school years in between, which include two uh, winter residencies. So the in-person sessions are those three weeks in early summer, it starts in May, um, and then two weeks in the winter. So in the early in the early summer, we'll be in Albuquerque at least part of the time at the University of New Mexico. And then we tend to travel through New Mexico on that residency. And then in the winter semester, we will have a residency site somewhere in the Americas. So I'm gonna walk you through the curriculum as this is one of the aspects that really differentiates us from many other programs. Uh, we have classes like Carol mentioned that support field-based learning for a more holistic practice in really specific ways. So when you begin each in-person residency, you arrive prepared with readings that we send you in advance. Um, and then this ties together with the discourse and the field-based learning classes. They're, the bulk of them uh, start in the summer and some, some of them go through the fall with online pieces and wrap up assignments. So for instance, you might be assigned a web development project or uh, bookmaking research project, uh, like the project Carol shared, the Otra Vi Visions one, um, or it could be a note, your personal research notebook assignment. And so you might be meeting with your professors after the intensive residency online to develop an artwork or a writing assignment. Uh, so it's a 26 month program of study and really follows this intense accelerated format. It's also a curriculum that's designed for maximum flexibility for working adults. So you can be at home and then come for the residency periods um, to the, these different sites. So I wanted to go through each of the courses that are listed here in a little bit more detail. So 
Art in Place Reconsidered is a class that addresses ethics of community and of place. Uh, we see what artists, leaders, and cultural members are doing, and we learn from their best practices while contributing to a project that we work on them, uh, we work with them beforehand to devise and uh, present in a syllabus beforehand. Techno Lab is a class where we focus on materiality and the tech spectrum. We like to say from craft to code. Code. It could be co-producing a podcast with the group on Seos with the new museum or working on Arduino code-based programming and wearable tech or learning backstrap weaving, which we were able to do on one residency in San Salvador with the artist Claudia Vega. A distinguished practitioner in this course, uh, students might work with uh, one example is the artist Pablo Helguera. We were able to work with Pablo on an artist lecture performance at the New Britain Museum in Connecticut. Um, other times we've been able to work with other artists co-designing a project with them. Carol mentioned Roxanne Swensel, who we uh, have worked a couple times with on, on harvesting clay and, and working through her practice with permaculture. Creative Economies focuses on rethinking value, time, and shared resources through a solidarity economics perspective. Um, research theory and writing classes um, consists of methodologies in contemporary art. That's an ongoing part of Confluence's strategy for learning art histories. In art history methodologies, you reflect on your practice and frame your work within the context of working artists. And in writing art and agency, uh, the techniques that we use focus on peer learning, accountability, and writing strategies. So you actually oftentimes work with your cohort closely in an online format, uh, passing pieces of writing uh, back and forth uh, with the faculty in between the process. Um, so there you might be working with a professor like Ricky Tucker, who's a writer, uh, Billy Lee, who's a writer artist, and Jamie Hamilton Ferris, who uh, is at the University of Hawaii as is a writer as well. And then River Lab, uh, Carol mentioned that class, it's, we look to the idea of river restoration through a more bureaucratic lens and think about what it could be to reimagine it uh, through art. A lot of times we um, use the Fluxus prompt as a starting point uh, for developing a project for that class. And then finally, the critique classes, uh, which run throughout the two years of the program. So to... Let me see if I can advance this. Okay, so we wanted you to see how the academic milestones of the University of New Mexico MFA program fit together with this coursework. So critique exchange and MFA projects are the are are the two classes that run through the entire program, and they buttress the formation of your committee of studies, which happens uh, with mostly University of New Mexico faculty, although you can invite faculty from other places or uh, people you work with from other places to become part of your committee of studies. And this committee of studies starts in your first year, towards the end of your first year, and follows you uh, through your second year up to, through these ad advancement periods and up to this exhibition catalog and public lecture. So we're really trying to combine this uh, confluence coursework with uh, the UNM criteria. And we can talk more about that later if you have questions. And to go into the pedagogy briefly, you might know something about this if, if you're interested in um, attending this today, but we actively work towards ways that we can make education more accessible and more interdependent with a focus on efficacy. Uh, so the we see that as the balance of a more formal art practice with a focus on effectiveness. How does it function in the world? Or systems, so we look at art systems from change-making systems uh, to the ecosystems of the materials that we use to the larger art system. And we embrace the messy tensions while interrogating them. And we look to trauma-informed pedagogy to work with cohorts in ways that don't reinscribe past traumas. So part of this has to do with how the program and the facilitators work ethically within a community as a visitor and as a guest, how we learn from ecologies embedded in the materials and the tools that 
we use and rely upon, how we embed work around anti-racism and privilege, solidarity economics, and interdisciplinary research methods from artist practitioners into the curriculum from the beginning. So the MFA in brief really tries to foreground what we say is regenerative culture, which we see as highlighting these different modes of, or highlighting um, abundance rather than scarcity, I'll say. Let me try to let somebody in. Okay. Uh, so the field-based philosophy is has its roots in reciprocity. The communities that we've been able to visit, we try to revisit um, and sustain working relationships with particular people in particular places whenever that's possible. So we try to keep going back to the same place and forming stronger bonds and, and working on longer term projects. A field-based educational philosophy also affects how we learn, as Carol mentioned. Uh, we can really deconstruct a typical classroom in this way. So you could find yourself in an ancestral space with Roxanne Swensel or a site like a museum where art an artist is making a new work. This is Pedro Lash, and um, I wasn't here on this trip, but it sounded great uh, working with Pedro on his, on his research process. Um, you could be engaged in learning practical skills. Uh, this um, image on the right is Linda Weintraub and our historian, and, and here people are in her Earthship home uh, learning how she cares for the land. And um, or you could be in a worker co-op with, this is Caroline Willard on the lower left, who is a professor that we work with often for the creative economies class. And we're honored to work with an extremely talented and generous and respected group of faculty based in the Americas. These are two images from an early residency in the Everglades. We work with artists whose practice is on the edges of art, ecology, and science often, and social engagement. Um, in this way, we hope that you're not only coming away with a scientific and ecological toolkit, but also a set of collaborative skills. Um, and then we work with artists and practitioners who really have a research-based practice. This is Camila Mariamba with Enseos, who's talking about their BOG project with the new museum, uh, which is something that students in an earlier residency participated in, and here she's sharing it back to a later residency as they work on the next steps. And uh, just a brief uh, list of some of the faculty who we've been able to work with and we continue to work with. And I will open it up for questions on, on this part, if anybody has some questions at this point. And again, just... Uh, Unmute yourself and I can't see you. And we can yeah, come back shy. at the end, of course, to, to other questions when you see the full presentation. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Yeah, it may be that people want to simmer a little bit. You could put in the any questions in the chat and we'll look at that together at the end as well. All right. Well. Well, why don't we continue on? I'm going to talk about ways to make it work. One of the most common questions and one of the most necessary questions we hear from prospective students is, how can I make this work financially? Our program's entire out-of-state tuition and fees, and most fees is approximately $48,000 for the 26 months of study. To help make this more accessible, we offer merit-based scholarships for up to about 30% of the cost. It should be known that everyone who applies to the program is considered for one of these scholarships. Another way we try to keep tuition lower is through the summers when everyone pays in-state tuition, whether you reside in New Mexico or not. For out-of-state students, there's also the potential of receiving an Amico scholarship which allows international students to pay in-state tuition. In the second year of the program, we encourage all of our students to apply for independent funding from the University of New Mexico Office of Grad Studies. Finally, student loans can be used to cover costs beyond tuition, such as travel and your living expenses. And we encourage all students to research local funding, such as Rotary scholarships or any other communities that you're part of that might have educational scholarships. 
We have a link to the application on our web page, and the URL for that is in red at the bottom of this slide. Uh, please note that you need to create a, an account to start your application. You also need to select the Confluence Low Residency Concentration. And so it's the case that you can't apply for both the in-person program and the um, Low Residency Confluence program. So you really need to choose which one you're going to apply to. And um, this is a separate application for each of those two programs. It also should be noted that international students should visit the UNM Global Education site for an additional application. If at any time you're having tech issues, let us know. Uh, we, we can answer your questions. We can guide you through the technology. So here are the required elements for an application. Um, it should be noted that you do need to hold an undergraduate degree. Most often this grad program has undergraduate degrees that are a BFA, but not always. It's most important that you have an undergraduate degree, but we have students coming from all different areas. So sometimes it's not the BFA. We review your transcripts from your undergrad education as part of assessing your readiness for grad school. And we conduct interviews with the top applicants in February. From those interviews, we send out offers of admission and also develop a waiting list. The numbers of applicants vary from year to year. On average, it's around 30 to 40 applicants for 10 spaces. In terms of the images, we're looking for 15 to 20 images. We want to see finished work, but we also want to see some indication of what you're exploring now, what you might be experimenting with. These images should be documented clearly, and you can also include time-based work. For those, you'll, you'll want to include a link to YouTube or Vimeo, and um, notice that for the images and videos, the part of the application you upload those into is called Special Requirements. We want to see your letter of intent, which is one to three pages, and an artist's statement of about one page. Um, these two documents will be uploaded in the writing sample area. And um, we want in those documents to really get an understanding of why this program is right for you, what, what you've accomplished so far, and what you hope to accomplish in the next 26 months in the program. As far as the CV or resume, you can include all relevant application on this. Um, sometimes going beyond a classic gallery style resume is a good way to show some of the things that have informed your practice that you've accomplished. And then we need three letters of recommendation. We encourage you to ask for those really early. These letters help us understand who you are through the eyes of those who have worked with you and have seen your art practice. As far as the transcripts go, um, the official transcripts are required, but if there's a delay with those, feel free to upload an unofficial transcript so that we can see what the transcript says. But do note that before you can be officially admitted, you need to uh, put in your official transcript from your undergrad degree. All right, as you consider whether this program is right for you, here are some of the attributes of the students in our program. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, these are sort of generalizations, but we wanna give you a sense of the type of student that thrives in our program. Have you been out of school and developed your own practice? Many of our students, um, you know, choose a low residency program because they already have the discipline, the momentum that they've built since their undergraduate education. And so that's really helpful if you've had a little time out on your own. Do you prefer to stay put where you live? Um, as a low residency program, this, uh, this program is structured around you having your own studio space, having access to the ways that you make your work. And we find that at the end of the program, when students graduate, this provides tremendous continuity that you're working in your own studio. It also, as we've mentioned, really enriches the program that you have that connection with a place. 
So do you want flexibility of hours? You need to be able to go to the residencies and that's not flexible, but around the residencies, um, you can do a lot of the work for this grad program um, whenever it works for you in your schedule. So as long as you have 12 to 15 hours a week for developing your work and then additionally time for some coursework, um, you will be doing fine. But when you do that work is somewhat flexible. Do you want to bring the learning back home? There's a really strong dynamic relationship between where each student lives and what they learn in this program. So you'll be bringing to your community what you're learning. And conversely, each student brings the experiences from their home into the program. And um, that's a big part of the learning on a peer-to-peer -peer level and really among everybody. Are you eager to travel? Um, of course, this program's field-based learning is perfect for those who wish to see the world in ways that are not accessible if you're traveling um, within the usual channels of being a tourist or a visitor. So our program really allows you to go deeper with an understanding of each of the places you visit. And finally, are you interested in new pedagogies? Um, a lot of our students are fascinated by how learning works, what the um, decolonial aspects of uh, trying to do education differently in a way that does not perpetuate um, harmful patterns of how education has been used in our colonial past. And so if you have a special interest in pedagogy, this can be a really good fit for you. Does anybody have questions about the admission process or kind of typical student profiles or um, anything about being a student in this program that you'd like to ask now? Uh, yeah, I, I, this is uh, Shane Flores. I have a question about in-state costs uh, based on the slide that was going over that, because um, your slide has the sort of out-of-state total cost for the program. What's the in-state total cost for the program? To give you, to give you a sense of that, um, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but to give you a sense, the credit per hour cost is about 600 per credit for in-state, whereas for out-of-state, it's a thousand something. So um, we can follow up with that. And actually let's put in the chat, the URL that has those costs. I can look that up while Mary's presenting and um, make sure that that gets in here um, because it is approximately a third the cost for in-state students um, with that in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition. Great question. Okay, thank you. Because the majority of our students are out-of-state, we yeah. tend to lead with that cost. Yeah. Um, but Shane, you had a follow-up. What were you going to say? Oh, uh, no, I just said thank you. But um, I'll, I may, well, never mind. I don't want to disrupt the thing. So I might communicate later about stuff, but I just was just saying thank you. Okay. Any other Great. questions thank you. at this point? Um, I have a question about um, inviting faculty in to serve as like critiquing your work or assessing you. Um, have there been examples of people who have done that in the past? There have what faculty. <laughs> yeah, actually, there've there've been a lot of uh, a, a lot of students have brought mentors in to be part of their committee of studies, and um, the committee of studies is made up of I, I think it has to be two uh, full time tenure track fine arts professors or art history professors, and um, one can be anybody and then one can be uh, somebody else from the University of New Mexico. Your, but your committee of studies can be as large as you want it to be technically. Although we kind of urge people to, to think about like four to five, just because you wanna schedule times with everybody when they can um, be there. But a lot of people have worked with a mentor um, from home or um, a, pa a previous professor, um, the options are completely open. And 
Okay, cool. Um, I was also wondering with how the program is structured, um, do you encourage people to create like site specific socially engaged or like community based work within the area that they're living and is like is that emphasized heavily um depending yeah, it depends oh, what oh, your purpose is like yeah. sorry <laughs> i have a little delay i'm in a rural place so sometimes we do that and uh anyway the that question depends a lot on your practice. So if you are working in a socially engaged way, this program is a super good fit for you because you don't have to drop where you live, move somewhere else, and then try to, you know, create a social engagement that is authentic in a new location. So um, yes, if you're working that way, this is a really good fit and you would be encouraged to continue on. Um, for every student in the program, no matter what their practice is, when there are opportunities that fit with their research trajectory to develop a local engaged process, we encourage that by all means. We're great believers in the wisdom of um, cultivating community through the arts. Um, but for some artists, we also want to note that maybe they're not at all socially engaged in, in that kind of way of socially engaged arts. And for those artists, they shouldn't feel like this program wouldn't also support them. Um, so one of the benefits of being part of an interdisciplinary cohort is that you will have a cohort with perhaps a filmmaker an art and agriculture person, an art and healing artist, a painter, a muralist, a printmaker, um, somebody who's working in the time-based arts, maybe in video and installation. Um, so the, the richness of that cohort is something that we really cherish. Uh, so that question can't be answered in one way for all students. I also wanted to add on that, um, for the opportunities to work with mentors you already have. Sometimes we ask students to have critiques outside of the faculty of confluence. And so in your critique class, for example, in the first year, that's the critique exchange class, we might say, okay, report back after three critiques with three different people, some UNM faculty, some in your place where you live, and um, that is a very enriching part of the process um, that can help you decide who you might want to have on your grad committee. Um, but I also want to say there's there's a type of format that some low residency programs have where you get a local mentor that sees you through the whole semester. We don't work that way because um, we feel that having a person that you work with for the entire year and then another person that you work with for your entire second year in MFA projects and critique exchange class gives our group a solidity because there are some group critiques and it also gives us the sense of your work more in depth and holistically than if you had the more choppy experience of a different mentor each semester. Yeah. Great questions. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions right now? I think there was something in the chat. Um, yeah, I have a couple, a logistical question. I'm wondering um, if you already know what the residency for 2025 is going to be. So... So we have two sites that we are considering and we have not announced that yet. So it is still in progress, um, but it will be in the Americas. We do consider what will be most exciting and valuable for our current students in that decision. And so we usually announce the winter residency site somewhere in the summer time previous to that winter. Yeah, and I'm going to scan the questions here. Um, 
Can I ask a quick question? I'm wondering yeah. what a student work profile could look like during the program. What are examples of student work? Let's round back to that after um, the final section of our presentation, because you will be seeing some um, examples of student work in that. And then was All it- All right, Mary, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Maybe Jill had a quick uh, question as well. Oh, thank you, Mary. Um, and sorry if I missed this, I was having some Wi-Fi or we're in general having Wi-Fi issues today. Um, as far as the critiques go and kind of support um, when we're back in our home studios, uh, what does that look like? What is cohort? I mean, one of the things that's so attractive is this idea of a peer cohort and um, weaving in faculty mentors and such. So what is the sort of active critique um, process like when we're back home and just engaged with our own practice? The uh, the critique process for critique exchange and MFA projects is similar. It's five one-on-one -on -one studio visits throughout a semester. So that would be, imagine the fall semester, uh, every two weeks you have a one-on-one -on -one visit with your professor. And most of the cohorts decide that they're going to have a once a week meeting. Um, where they talk about their work. And we found that we don't mandate that, but that seems to happen often. And uh, then there are critiques, group critiques within that. So either one to two group critiques uh, within that time as well. So imagine at least one group critique and five uh, visits with one-on-one -on -one visits with your professor. Okay. I will go on um, since we had the question about uh, student work and alumni work, uh, it's a perfect time to talk about um, how the alumni are really working in a number of different ways. And I think that's one reason I, I, I think the, this program is so exciting because people end up merging fine art with science, with communication, uh, education, even small business. So an example would be uh, Blair Butterfields at the bottom of this list who founded an ethical plant-based product company, or somebody like Tara Long who is maybe doing a more traditional art route where she just had an exhibition at the Prez Art Museum in Miami uh, to Megan Driving Hawk, who's an, now an award-winning win public school educator. Um, so a bunch of different routes people go and we support them. And part of that process of having the MFA projects or critique exchange is really figuring out what drives each person and what direction they want to go in and tailoring um, a program for them. So we have some student work samples. At this point, we have a group of about 46 students who have come through the program, alumni, and we wanted to just choose a representative body of work. Um, so Carol mentioned some of the ways that people are, are working, uh, public art, storytelling, sculpture, social practice, video, performance, uh, even dance and, and pedagogy. Uh, this is Ben Howe's work. He's... Um, right now showing at the Center for Heritage Arts and Textile in Hong Kong uh, and doing these workshops that involve making and implementing a forager suitcase that's filled with things that are necessary to work in a group on making recipes, on botany, and on, on community exercises. This is uh, the work of Zahar Aldaba, who is currently an working as an educator at the Museum of the City of New York and is our alumni artist in residence. So in that process, you apply to be an alumni artist in residence and you obtain more teaching experience and uh, help us with the project that's, um, in this case, we're looking at a, a longer term teaching project and you also work on a book of your own work. Uh, this is Fatrick Bawang's work. Uh, Fatrick is showing internationally right now in Europe and in Ghana and makes art and uh, wearable art from refuse in Ghana. This is the work of Just Blaustein. So Just came to the program with a PhD in literature and wanted to develop her art practice. So these are images from her recent exhibition at Plaxall Gallery in New York. Uh, these are called survival tools for the age of ultra anxiety. Um, this is 
A video artist, Aubrey Murdoch. Uh, here she is storytelling about extraction from and colonialism from her the place she grew up in, I believe, Idaho. Um, and she is currently teaching at Montclair State University and leads the People's Free College at the in Orange, New Jersey. Uh, Elizabeth Boucher Deek is working in art and permaculture in France right now, and her work uh, really tried to articulate word etymologies into sensory experiences. I don't know, Carol, is that how you would describe it? It's very, it's very sensorial. Um, yeah, and with a sub theme of art and healing. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Um, this is Rory Sparks, who who started this social practice project called Working Library. It's interactive. It was based in Portland, Oregon. It was then purchased by an art foundation called C3. And then they hired Rory to be their director. So she's now salaried through this social practice, through what started as a social practice project uh, that's now taking root in multiple locations in Oregon. And this is Jared Cluck, who works with materials uh, through an ecosystem on a small backyard farm in where is uh, what town is this in <laughs> do you sorry I keep Missouri. referring Missouri in Missouri in a in a town in Missouri we forget we I don't remember the name of it um but he raises chickens he was making this work up um, that revolved around the symbolism in an egg and he uh, ended up utilizing all of his art materials came from his farm and he's still working in this way and starting an art residency there. This is Leslie Sobel, who uh, recently received a grant to travel in the Arctic where she was recording glaciers. And these are drawings and paintings at a recent solo exhibition at Grace College called The Car Cartography of Loss, is what I wanted to say. Um, Andrew Wesh, who is, who for his uh, thesis project made devices with Arduinos in order to make tree uh, parts spout poetry. So it was sort of an abstract poetry making device. Uh, this is the work of Sto Len, who's an artist with a pretty diverse practice from printmaking to performance. His thesis exhibition consisted of finding, uh, making these prints with waste that he found at a Superfund site in New York. And he was recently awarded this pair residency, uh, an artist in residence that pairs an artist with a city agency in New York. And he uh, is now was is now working for the Department of Sanitation through a grant. And finally, this is Sarah Rutherford, who is based in Rochester, New York, and she is a well-regarded muralist, illustrator, and an activist. And did this um, work called Her Voice Carries, which was then turned into a PBS documentary. And Sarah is still doing this work uh, throughout her community in Rochester. And I think we were just going to end with this slide of Meryl Eucles with Stowe Len uh, as he's working um, for the Department of Cultural Affairs and the Department of Sanitation in this residency. And finally, we will open it up fully for questions and take a look in the chat and see what we missed that might have come in. And I will also stop my screen share. I think, hold on. Thank you, Mary. So it's really special to see how many of you are here on this busy week and um, now we want to just further the conversation as a time check. We have 10 more minutes before um, our 60 minute time is done. And so um, I also want to mention that if you have questions that come up after you see this presentation and you want to reach out, we're happy to uh, set up individual meetings or answer questions through email. And now I'm going to scan. I have a question. What, it looks, yeah. I'm wondering what you would recommend for older students who've been working, teaching for 20 years and uh, been an artist practicing, but the recommendation letters are tough to figure out at this stage. I'm not in an academic environment, 
And I don't show my work by choice. I just not interested at this stage. What would you suggest? That's a great question. Um, I think that we've, we see this a lot, first of all. So um, because we're an interdisciplinary program that celebrates artists from a variety of backgrounds, um, we often see very effective letters of recommendation that combine an aspect of how that person knows you as an artist and that you have a connection to your practice, but they might see that in a different context, whether that's through your teaching environment at school, whether that's through a project that you worked with them on, uh, which could have been one of their artistic projects, um, or whether that is your commitment to your community or to um, the populations that you teach. There are many ways, once you sit down and you think about what makes you ready for grad school, I would start with that. Like, what am I bringing to grad school? And then find people who can witness those attributes and um, passions and the things that you're dedicated to in your life that you will be drawing from uh, in your work to come. So does that help? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Other questions? I do have one more. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I haven't found anywhere the date, the actual dates of the early summer and the midwinter programs. They vary year to year. And so this year, our summer residency starts in late May. We are inching that residency a little earlier so that it's easier for our students and UNM faculty to overlap. Um, so we used to always be in June, but now part of our residency is happening a little bit earlier in May. And um, it's probably a safe bet for you to Mark on your calendar, uh, anticipatory marking that uh, the last week of May, the first two weeks of June for the summer residencies at this point. Again, it may nudge a little earlier. In the winter, it's good to just generally think of it as the first weekend following um, the New Year's holiday, following January 1st because our residencies start on a weekend and end on a weekend. And um, that's probably your safest way to think through the dates. So for January 24, we are arriving on Saturday the 6th and we begin classes on the 8th and we depart on the 21st. And that's give or take a few days every year. We can put our emails in the chat so you can email us with questions too. Yeah, that's great. I also want to mention that we will have some additional webinars in the upcoming weeks. So if you follow us on social media, uh, you will be able to hear about that. And um, we will also alert you through the same, through this participati participatory list, like everybody who participated today will let you know of upcoming webinars as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks thank you all time. for being here. Yeah.
Well, we might wrap it up considering that we've had a few question moments and um, you know how to reach us if you come up with questions, which so often happens right after the webinar. <laughs> so uh, I'll Julia, give it see. one last Julia moment. Has Is there another question? Can you explain Great. the logistics for it? The traveling residencies, are student accommodations arranged included in the costs? So um, we, we arrange accommodations in advance. Uh, in most cases, there are sometimes when we are in New Mexico and Albuquerque where we're more flexible, but when we're traveling for the winter residency, we um, make arrangements beforehand that are the most affordable arrangements uh, we can find that are the closest to where we will want to be. Um, and there are also times within those residencies that we say, okay, now if you want to stray from this plan, you're welcome to, if you're looking for your own B and B, or if you're, you have a friend in this place and you want to stay with them. Um, we do that too. If you have a friend in a place and you want to stay with them, we usually let that happen at any time, but we like to make sure that we're basically traveling together um, within classes, but it is an, an extra cost. It's not included in the cost of the tuition. Uh, that's That cost isn't, but um, it is usually fairly affordable cost. Also, that's the same case with food often. Sometimes it's included in the course, but there are some meals that are not. Yes, and I would add on to that, um, and forgive me if I missed this, I was typing a message um, to one of our participants. I found that last year, everybody who applied for a special scholarship from the Global Education Office for the costs of the winter residency received it. So that offset the winter residency cost by $600. And so there is some internal funding that can help for international residencies specifically. Well, we can't wait to see applications and get to know you further. And um, if you're not sure yet, that you are going to apply and you have other questions, as we've mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and yeah, I'm really glad that we could have this conversation today. Thank you. All right, well, we're done. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 the recording.